We've been about this work, diversity, equity, inclusion, belonging, shared through the voices of a white woman and a black man. We bring lived experiences. We have pursued DNI progress for most of our professional lives. We use Crazy and the King to cover news, tips from colleagues and host incredible guests. Listeners, count on Julie and I to transparently drive the conversation. We thank you for rocking with us. Check it. Julie, kick off the show. Welcome to Crazy and the King. Woo! Um, so let me just say uh, we are almost at the end of 2022. Uh, yet again, uh, another year flying by and you know, sometimes it's often hard to remember like where we started. You know, I tend to think about, you know, we 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 get to the end of uh, of a year, end of December, um, which happens to be my favorite month of the year. Uh, we set these uh, manifestos, manifest, uh, uh, what do you call it? Uh, resolutions, manifestos, resolutions, all of these things that we want to do. And then you look up, blink twice, and you're back at the same point. So my question is, do you feel like you achieved much of what you wanted to achieve in January of 2022? So personally, I feel like I achieved a a lot of what I wanted to achieve in 2022. I wanted to have a house here in Portugal by the midterms. I wanted to find better work-life balance. Uh, I wanted to just sort of level out a little bit on some of my intensities. From the business perspective, uh, Crazy and the King has had its best year yet. Disability Solutions has had its best year yet. Um, But the one thing I will say I did not do that I promised myself, and now I'm making this promise again publicly for 2023, is I did a very poor job of getting back on stage now that we're back in conference seasons. That's what I've got to do well in 2023. Hmm. That's interesting. Uh, because one of the things that I wanted to ask you is like, who is a favorite speaker? And by the way, before you answer that, think about that. Um, what I will say, I, I want to be fair and answer. I didn't achieve the things that I wanted to achieve. Um, okay. I'll put them out there too. Number one, creative. Uh, I have long wanted to attack the DNI space from a more creative standpoint, uh, not a practical standpoint of consulting, not a practical standpoint of speaking or coaching, all three uh, in which I do, but I've wanted to create content. I've wanted to be more creative. So that is still elusive to me. The, the second thing that I've still yet to achieve is dropping a piece of technology in the DNI space. Let me tell you, I'm 54. That's just the truth of the matter. And while I feel like I have the energy, um, I have the presence, the charisma, I still believe there needs to be an act two of Torn in this DNI space. And I want my act two to be a piece of technology. So one more year. I've still not achieved what I've wanted to achieve in the DNI space. A favorite speaker? Do you have one? Oh yes. Um, right now, I would say my favorite is Eddie Gloud Jr. Do you know him? Do I? Okay, I was gonna say I'm. I'm gonna school you if you don't. But do, but do school me though. Do fire. school me because because um. <laughs> it's, it's 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 not for me. It's for the listeners. So tell me your schooling of Eddie Gloud. Why do you like him? Yeah. Um, So he is a he's the chair of the African-American studies uh, department at Princeton, has written dozens and dozens of articles, several books, um, including Democracy in Black, How Race Still Enslaves America, Enslaves the American Soul. Um, Perfect conversation for our guests today. And he just he says things in such a plain way and such a like no fucking around. It it is black and white with Eddie. And he doesn't allow people to sort of skirt and play these little political, you know, responses and games. He calls it how it is. And he just takes you to church in a way that is so intense because he's so smart. He's just knows the history that, um, 
you know, impacts black and brown people in this country today and has for, you know, hundreds of years. And then he can tie it to the economics and the politics of it. It's beautiful. So I I absolutely agree with you. He is extremely smart. And one of the things that you said is uh, straight talk. One of my favorite speakers happens to be Cornell West, who is also extremely smart. Uh, And Cornell West has a phrase, parhesia, that making things extremely plain so that you can understand them. And and part of the reason why I enjoy listening to Cornell West uh, prior to giving presentations, I like his cadence. I like his ability to captivate an audience for 60, 90 minutes, no slides. But what I learned in watching him over the years, Jay, is He didn't feel obligated to recreate new speeches every single time he stood in front of an audience. That repetition is necessary for people to receive and to really digest and take in the information. We are in a place in another time where there is so much information around us that you do have to repeat things quite a few times for it to really set in with individuals. And when we think about the conversation that we're going to have this afternoon, um, I'm sorry, later in the show with our guest, Nikki, it bears repeating. So this is one of the episodes where I hope our listeners not only share it with their social tribes, but that you listen to it over and over and over again. So without any additional delay, why don't we, um, why don't we take a quick break and then let's get to our guest, Nikki. Lanier. Today's job seekers are experiencing a labor market unlike any other in history. Priorities, expectations have drastically shifted over the past year as the motivations of the modern workforce continue to dominate the hiring landscape. With millions of available jobs and talent seeking roles that better align with our own personal requirements, today's job seekers are leveraging their upper hand to secure new jobs, higher wages, and better benefits. Workers are making it clear they want more from employers and they feel empowered to ask for it. The 2022 Job Seeker Nation report seeks to help recruiters and employers understand how to adapt to our current reality of talent acquisition and remain competitive in today's labor market. Download now at jobvite.com forward slash C-A-T-K. to meet our guest this week in Nashville in September earlier this year. And we had actually already scheduled Nikki to be on the show. And I was walking around at inspirehr.com where we were um, exhibiting and I'm like, oh, wait, I recognize that name, Harper Slade. And I waited and kind of semi-stalked. You don't know that. But (laughs) semi-stalked our our guest um, until I got to sit down and have a fantastic conversation with her, uh, Nikki Lanier, founder and CEO of Harper Slade. She is unyielding in her commitment to advance racial equity for some and equality for all. Nikki has 20 plus years experience in HR, employment law, and time served as a C-suite executive with arguably the world's most formidable central bank. Welcome to the show, Nikki. Thank you so much. I'm so excited to be a part of this auspicious body. This is fantastic. I can't (laughs) wait to dive into this conversation. Oh, and we're going to do just that. You know, when we talk about diving in and we talk about being auspicious, Uh, I want to go back to something that Jay said in the introduction, and I put it there purposefully because I I don't know if people heard it. So I'm going to repeat it. Advance racial racial equity for some and equality for all. Equity for some, equality for all. Mm -hmm. Talk about that distinction because the for Mm -hmm. some piece definitely leaves some people out. And so I want that learning and that discerning mind to kind of hear you um, explain why you frame it, why you position it in that way. Well, it's an important positioning. And I thank you for asking me that question right at the outset. <clears throat> so let me let me answer it this way. This is how I define racial equity. It is proportional fairness that takes into consideration the cultural and historic realities that have beset people of color 
as distinct from all other people and works to remedy the same. So when I think about the urgency around amplifying equity, it is for the population of folks that have experienced the most inequity in this country and the same population of folks for whom the consequences of continued inequity are most dire, black and brown folks. So when I talk about equity for some, I'm specifically talking about black people and Hispanic people, thereby helping to pave the way for equality for all, meaning all marginalized people, all people who are navigating the life of other or different, whatever that is. Um, and then ultimately all mankind as you know, Pollyanna is at my sound. So that's what, that's how I narrow my niche and that's how I focus my work. So I love Pollyanna. We need to keep Pollyanna <laughs> in our work because if not, we, we sort of drown sometimes. Um, we'll be stir crazy. Yep. Yep, exactly. So I want to go back to something you said, but I first want to start with your background. When you told me about your sort of career trajectory, I thought I can sit and geek out with this amazing woman all day. Um, so tell us who Nikki is and and your kind of journey on your roadmap to now Harper Slade. Yeah. So I started out my career uh, practicing labor and employment law in South Florida. I went to law school at the University of Miami after having finished at uh, Hampton University with a degree in journalism. Um, so I spent, I spent so much time practicing law and really understanding how employers try to find their way toward just complying with the behaviors that the law says you have to subscribe to in the workplace. And even that, for many, was a difficult undertaking. Uh, and then moving into HR, where I spent probably 18 years, I guess, uh, and I work for public sector and private large companies in small East Coast, West Coast. I've been the chief HR officer three different times. And oh my gosh, I just really began to understand and pay attention to how work works, when and where it restores, when and where it depletes, when there are continued breaches between what we expect from work and need from work to deposit into us and what in fact we receive when that breach continues in a continual in a continual way. Um, what does that mean for the way that we can find ourselves toward engagement? And this is not about race, gender, any of that stuff. It's just in general, as human beings, we come to work needing to be fed. I mean, that, that's just a part of it, in addition to the widget making. And so the, that feeding, if you will, kind of manifests very differently depending on the narrative that you come into the workplace with, the narrative that we're all assigned when we come into work. And so I started really studying that and becoming a, becoming a student of that in my own experiences as a Black woman navigating incredibly hostile, um, inhospitable environments that didn't know what to do with my the way my potency showed up in my black skin, uh, just navigating that just became its own burden. And uh, so I was just paying attention to that. And then the last seven years I spent working for the Fed, not in a late legal or HR capacity. I was doing macroeconomic policy, monetary theory, go figure. I don't know. Don't, people ask me how, I don't know. So anyway, I happened into that great role. Seven years I spent in that and really uh, started to understand from a community and employment's perspective, uh, the cost of inequity, like how much does it cost for our country to be both racist and sexist? Um, and there's a dollar figure attached to that, trillions and trillions of dollars. So then, that, you know, that's really kind of what informs my work, that, 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 that body of kind of academic and professional experiences. But what motivates me, what motivates me is the, you know, is, as Dr. King would say, is the fierce urgency of now. There, there's, a, there's a reality around the 2045 browning of, a, of the country that we've got to reconcile. We have to reconcile um, here right now because America's getting blacker and browner. It's not getting any whiter. And uh, you can't sustain an economy with the majority of your population having had no real meaningful experience with how the economy works because they've been excluded from it. So that's kind of how I think about this work. That's what informs the work. That's what motivates my work. And that's like the tapestry that I bring to the lens with which I practice. You've used words like proportional and fairness and beset and navigating <laughs> inhospitable uh, environments. You also use words, beautiful words like uh, restores or restoration, repletes, mm -hmm. which is taken away. And so yes. you, the last one that I want uh, to, to latch on and stay with is the reconcile, the reconciliation. And so how, Nikki, do we do a better job or, or let me, 
let, let's not go with the solution yet or, or proposed yeah. solution. Let's mm-hmm. go with how have we failed to reconcile? Give us a couple of examples of how perhaps corporate America, public policy, how have we failed to do some of that restoration and that reconciliation that's required? So America has always, since its inception, been a country that leans toward marginalization, muting, and stunting of its browner citizen. Um, It has never known what to do with Black and brown people other than punish Black and brown for being Black and brown. Um, Now, what we have, what we've tried to do, our, our attempts at remediating that has manifested in the form of policy and law, right? So we promulgated things like Title VII and, um, you know, Voters Voter Rights Act and, and uh, equal opportunity laws. We've promulgated these laws. Really what they do uh, is kind of beat back the manifestations of what's in your heart. So said differently, if you truly believe that Black and brown people are marginal, that they are subhuman, um, and not endowed with the inalienable rights that many believe were given to all humans, at least via the Declaration of Independence. If you believe that somewhere in your psyche, either overtly or covertly, laws will tell you what you can and cannot do to manifest that belief. But we've never dealt with a belief. We've never asked people to unpack what do you truly believe to be true about the value of Black and Brown people. We don't ask that in work. We don't ask that in home. We don't ask that in any kind of sustained, like consistent way. And because of that, we've never had to unearth it. We've never had to put it on the table and call it out and and reckon with ourselves and with our psyche around that belief system. Our work at Harper Slade starts there. It is the harder work, the more daunting work. Some might say, you know, the work that will yield little benefit, but I don't buy into any of that. Uh, I, I believe that work, this kind of work has to start with belief systems. So where we have failed, Torin, is believing that if we erect enough laws and policies and statements and banners and monikers and, and statements and slogans, that somehow that will neutralize what beats in the heart of most human beings. And that is the the inherited understanding that black and brown are not equal to white. And that's what we have to deal with, I think, in work and in every other aspect of our lives. That is not a milk toast approach. Uh, you <laughs> are, I mean, very, very direct. You are clear as, um, you know, one of my favorite speakers, Cornell West says, that is yeah. parhesia. You know, that is straight talk, <laughs> parhesia. Yeah. That is straight talk right there. How, how do clients receive that? You know, if, if that is where you are starting, you're starting with that mindset shift and that behavior modification system, and you are going right at it. How yeah. does that sit? I mean, I know it sits well because you're in business. You continue to be in business. But do you feel like the seats ruffle a little bit? Do you see some folks trying to get to the exit doors when you are speaking? <laughs> You know, I I know that feeling. I've I've stood on stage and watched people run for the exit doors when they know Head Tori's the about to go. That's right. That's right. Oh, I know. I know how how does it right. sit? How does it sit? Uh, so I'll say I'll say two things, and th- th- here's my caveat. I, unlike both of you, I'm fairly new to my entrepreneurial journey, so I'm ten months in. I'm not even a year old yet. All right. So congratulations. Thus far, too. thank you, thank you, yes. thank you, thank you. Yes, indeed. Thus far, the kind of clients that we've cultivated that we've courted uh have some leaning into this work at very at fairly senior levels already and they're pained by black and brown turnover right so you know usually what happens is in you have these uh organizations largely white leadership who are just like we just can't hold on to black talent we can't hold on to brown talent we don't know what's going on we give them mentors like we you know i.e we try to fix them <laughs> so um, what I what I try to help folks do is understand that the the our, our niche is helping you cultivate environments where black and brown talent can thrive. That first requires that our clients recognize that no matter what attempts you have um, even earnestly tried to this point, 
Um, unless you have done the belief system unpacking, unless you've asked questions of your leaders and your managers and your supervisors about what they believe around black and brown people, how they grew up, what they read growing up, how well-traveled are they? Have they ever had anything other than episodic engagements with black and brown people prior to coming to work? Unless you're like diving into those kinds of questions, your environment is just not going to work for black and brown folk. It can't be the first time that you engage with me, Nikki, the first time you ever engage with a black person is in the workplace and now you're managing me and all you can bring to that is stereotype because that's all you got. You don't have any lived experience really with regular cadence with somebody like me. So our clients tend to kind of already know that. That's that's one thing. So we try to be very judicious in how we're like vetting who's coming into the Harper Slade fold. But then the second thing is, and I'll be blunt about this, one of my one of my biggest marketing strategies strategies is um my public speaking. I do a lot of talks, a lot of conferences and keynotes and stuff on this. And so when people hear me talk about this and then come up after and say, we'd like to work with you, they kind of know how I get down. They kind of know what to, you know, what to expect and what they kind of need to ready themselves for. Um, and I don't, you know, I don't browbeat because I, I, I mean, I get where we are. I understand on some level how it could happen that you could be in this place in life and be, you know, white, male, heterosexual, able body and really have no other lens assigned right to no other lens than yours. I understand that. Um, but I also understand the consequences of that. So we try to help them through that. Julie, you now, now, I mean, you, you got to see personally and in real life, why I ran to my table. <laughs> no exaggeration. Like you had a chance to talk to Nikki for what sounds like a, semi extended period of time. I talked to Nikki for five, maybe 10 mm -hmm. minutes, more like five and literally ran to my table and shot you a text message. and was like, we get Nikki on this podcast because I know that she is going to jewel drop in a way that I can't do it. Um, it's Thank just you. not my space. It's not my sandbox. What a, um, I, I just so appreciate that straight talk, straight to it, but the level of love that it is wrapped in and how you approach and do the work. Thank you. Yeah, Thank I, you. And as soon as she mentioned both employment law and economics, I was I was hooked. Um, and I kind of want to go back to that vein. So you talked to, or you said on Instagram yeah. relatively recently, everything about racial equity is counterintuitive, countercultural, mm -hmm. foreign, and uncomfortable. However, the advancement of black and brown people, especially economically, is fundamental to our collective survival. At some point, the cost of racism drowns the entirety of the country. And from a, I want to talk about that from an economic perspective in a minute, but when you're talking to your clients, and so you're having sort of this, I'll call it a come to Jesus sort of unpacking of, of beliefs and starting what I assume is a fairly long journey to unprogram the way that white people have been programmed our entire existences. Um, how do you also lay out for them um, the real financial implications of the journey that they're starting for their company? Yeah. <clears throat> well, many of the leaders, because we've been blessed so far to really engage with fairly senior leaders inside of the organization, they, they're they they're friends of the Fed, um, usually Fed followers or have some orientation with the work of the Federal Reserve. And so I uh, unapologetically rely very heavily on the studies having been promulgated by the Fed because um, I'm familiar with most of them. And uh, it is it is usually captivating to to most of the folks that I speak to when they understand that um, racism over the last 20 years has cost this country $16 trillion in lost GDP, said in a different kind of spin, we spend $16 trillion every 20 years to be racist. Um, and then every five years, we spend um, $5 trillion. So it's a trillion dollars a year at this point moving, moving forward. And that's when black and brown are not the majority in the available workforce. Um, and so that tends to be a captivating number and it's arresting. So I get attention, right? When, when I, when I talk about that staggering of a dollar figure, but then I move into why our work focuses on the workplace as the incubator for resetting beliefs, 
with the hope that what you're incubating and in work will translate to the way that you like parent and the way that you show up in your community, who you are engaging with over your dinner conversations, like the way that you reset your understanding of black and brown people in, um, like forever. And and here's here's the argument, Julie. The um since since the Federal Reserve and quite frankly, even fiscal policy, so fiscal policy leaders at co- i.e. Congress, monetary policy leaders, i.e. Federal Reserve, since we've been studying the health of the economy, uh, usually the first place we look is the middle class to determine how well the middle class is doing. Um, what do consumptions rate, consumption rates look like there? Uh, home ownership, higher education attainment, wage pressures, spending and saving on what? What does that look like? That helps us really understand kind of the behaviors, the needs, <clears throat> um, the trajectory for the entire economy, really based on that middle class glance. And since we've been studying this, since the Fed and, and, and Congress have been looking at this, we've always relied on white people to sustain, to really buoy that middle class, which is kind of fine in, because in that, what I mean by that is that um, it, it's a population that that's a population of folks for whom um, artificial com- encumbrances into getting in middle class and moving up middle class are just not a reality. They're not a, as acute. So for the first time ever in just 23 years, by 2045, we will be relying on black and brown people to move um, swiftly into the middle class and to be saturated inside middle class because black and brown will also be the majority in the available workforce. Whoever's the majority in the available workforce historically must also be the majority in middle class. In this inflationary period, middle class is between like sixty to one hundred twenty thousand dollars, and with that, with that uh, range, black people and brown people have never, ever, ever been meaningfully represented in middle class, and so it is an unsustainable model for the American economy. Right? We can't sustain the middle class if we don't move black and brown folks into it um, with more um, swift focus. Uh, and this is a this is I'm sorry one last one last point. So this is the reason why this is so important is um, because what studies have also shown, and this is both promulgated from the Fed and from major uh, HR consulting firms, is that one of the bigger impediments into Black and Brown economic mobility up and through workplaces is racism. Not 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 being prepared. It's not about not being prepared. It's not being not well trained. It's not being a good fit. It's just the way that racism shows up and manifests as a inhibitor to um, promotional opportunities, to um, you know the performance evalu pro- performance evaluation process. Gosh, I couldn't get that out. Um, and you know the assignments for exposure to senior leaders, all of which kind of lead to promotional opportunities, even the entry level salaries. So we know that there's always inequity. There has always been inequity. Never have we had a time where there's not been inequity for Black people in workplaces around wages. Um, but certainly the conditions of employment and the experiences of employment further exacerbate issues around Black economic, black and brown economic mobility and work. So we got to fix it. Or the economy is going to be unstable. So that's kind of like, you know, <laughs> three hours later, that's what I'm trying to say. No, I, I'm like trying to get in a question before Torn jumps in with the question. So I'm like waiting for the pause. Um, okay, so when you take that, right, it, which is something I did not know before right this minute when, when you taught me about the, um, the, the 2045 number and thinking about GDP and the middle class. And then we also have this other economic policy um, in, this, in this country, and I will not explain it as well as you are, but we also really work by uh, by the the laws and and policies that we have in place to make sure that it is much more difficult for young people to create wealth in this in this country. So in terms of like as an example the pandemic with all of the bailouts in terms of of big companies what would have happened is older businesses would have gone out, young entrepreneurs would have started new businesses, and that opportunity to generate wealth would have started there. And then you have the other biggest piece of, of creating wealth within this country for the middle class is home ownership, which is now also out of reach for many uh, younger people. How does that multiply um, our need to take action for um, for 
this group of people, right, young black and brown people to also be able to overcome additional barriers that sometimes may not exist in the same way for older black and brown people. Or I could just be completely wrong. Yeah, I, I don't see much by way of a generational urgency as, I, as as much as I do. I mean, I'm not suggesting your argument is flawed in any way, but I, from my perspective and my vantage point, I see, I see the issue more rooted in how we see the value of black and brown humanity, the, the presumption of assigned value to black and brown bodies, irrespective of age um, and gender, is just um, far too elusive and too conditional. Like black people especially tend to matter only in context with like a footnote or asterisk and even then for like a finite period of time. It's very conditional. And that has its, has a cost irrespective of age. And so it plays out more acutely sometimes depending on like generational nuances and like some of the generational consider- considerations. But the fundamental premise under which all of this rests is this understanding, this kind of presumption of um, black and brown diminishment. I wish, like, I I swear, I wish I I knew you um, about 12, 14 months ago when I curated a uh, speaker series for one of my clients. And the client was Ice Mortgage. And I would have absolutely had you in the lineup, I actually would have taken myself out of the lineup and left in the other two women. And I would have added you because the richness is something that should not be ignored. And so I just want you to know, Nikki, I absolutely appreciate how you have framed this work. You you mentioned on your website, people will be able to see it, uh, that workplace turnover due to racial inequity has cost $172 $172 billion over the yeah. past five yeah. years. You speak mm-hmm. specifically about the required collaboration across the entire franchise to include a ribbon of public policy where I think we are missing. Uh, and this is just a statement. And then I want, I want to close on Nikki. Uh, I'm sorry, Slade Harper. I just have to mention, I would love to see our politicians as bold as this right here. I don't need them <laughs> to too. stand, you know, I don't need them to <sighs> to stand and curse people out or any of those things, but I do need them to be unafraid to say black and brown people or black people or brown people or uh those that are older, if you will. I need them to call a thing a thing and not be afraid to create policy legislation that speaks directly to that audience, that group. I appreciate what you've done. Tell us about Slade Harper. Love the name. I know the history. Those that are listening can go out to Slade Harper. I'm sorry, HarperSlade.com. Harper Slade, yeah. Harper Slade. I got it t- twisted around. They can go to HarperSlade.com, HarperSlade.com. But tell us about the beautiful work that is being done by you and your team. Yeah, so thank you for the opportunity. Harper Slade is named in honor of my grandmothers. It is their, my paternal and maternal grandmother's last names respectively. And uh, they gave birth to two amazing souls who were very steeped in the civil rights movement. And my parents are the inspiration as well as my grandmother's um, for my work every single day. I I see this as almost an assignment passed in utero for me to to be uh, meaningful and using my blackness for blackness, as my grandmother used to say. Um, So what's next for us? We, you know, since we've been at this for a couple of months now, uh, one of the things that we're noticing, Torin, with our clients is that you know, even with the most, the best of intentions, our clients still struggle with how to practice these new skills and reset belief systems in the workplace because they got to go home, most of them back to segregation. Most of us still live in very homogeneous environments. And so we go back to trusted circles where everybody, our friends, our families, our loved ones, the people that we go out to dinner with and have gone vacation with, they're usually the same political affiliation, same socioeconomic class, same race, um, same kind of thought patterns. And it's hard to disrupt those circles. Um, that's where we are nested. That's where we feel our greatest sense of comfort. So what, what we're looking at next year is, is moving to more of a focus where we're going to uh, focus on retreats to help empower those that have influence in homes, in their homes and in their workplaces to become ambassadors for this work, to really kind of stand flat footed. I love that you talk about that with their, with their backbones absolutely straight and, and 
understand from a very personal standpoint why we must be the generation. It is this dispensation in time, us drawing breath together on the planet right now, who have to do in 23 years what we've not been able to do in 400. And that is assure that racism can no longer live here. So that's what we're looking at doing next year, in addition to all the other great work we're doing. Yeah. When when are you doing the first retreat? Oh, good Lord. I don't know. We just kind of okay. came up with this concept. It probably won't be any time earlier than fourth quarter last next year. Fourth quarter next year. Okay. Got it. Yeah, um, yeah. Well, I'm sure we'll talk a number of times before then, but I want to see if I can participate and not present, be present, but I want to see if I can um, participate in a way that gifts and or allows an individual to be there who otherwise may not be able to afford to be there. All right. Because oh I gosh, absolutely you. believe in your work. Thank you. Oh, Torin, thank you so much. That's wonderful. And wonderful absolutely <clears throat> market it out to all of our Crazy in the King listeners and all that stuff. However we can support you is excellent. So harperslade.com on Instagram, harperslade, LLC. Um, where else should our listeners find and connect with you, Nikki? Yeah, so we have we're face on Facebook, uh, LinkedIn, YouTube. Um, if anyone wants to reach out by email, we're at admin at harperslay.com. And of course, our website, www.harperslay.com. Wonderful. Thank you, Nikki Lanier, for joining us this year on Crazy and the King. Hi there. I'm Heather Drago. And I'm Sarah Saunders. We host the podcast, That's a Hard No, about saying no and setting boundaries. So you can become that true and empowered you that this world needs. Saying no isn't just okay. It's the key to living an authentic, fulfilling life. I'm a licensed professional clinical counselor. So while this podcast is in no way a replacement for one-on-one therapy, I suppose I know what I'm talking about. I'd say so. We talk about learning to say no and set healthy boundaries and how it impacts mental health, physical health, relationships, parenthood, and more. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts and visit our website, hardknowpodcast.com. We're here to help you find your no and say it unapologetically. That's a hard no. Awesome. Like this. Did she do some jewel dropping? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Did she drop the receipts as mm-hmm. the young folk? Oh. Yeah, yeah. She put it out there. And, you know, in the spirit of Nikki and the work that she is doing, uh, we are absolutely going to amplify women in our Her Voice segment that are focused on financial inequity and social impact and social justice. And our first uh, individual in Her Voice this week is Gita. I believe it's Gita. It could be Gita uh, Gobanath. Uh, she is an Indian American economist serving as the first deputy managing director of the International Monetary Fund or the IMF. Uh, it's the number two leadership position, and she has been in such since January 21st of this year. Hats off to Gita. And Tolu Lawrence, who is the Managing Director of Programs and Partnerships at Just Capital. She leads the program team in developing cross-sector partnerships and engaging America's largest companies to advance job quality and equity in the workplace. And then last but not least, Genesette Gutierrez. Uh, She is a community organizer for Familia. It's a trans queer liberation movement, and they go by the acronym TQLM. Uh, Gutierrez is a transgender rights activist, an undocumented community organizer, and you might remember her from her national attention that she received in 2015 when she interrupted America's favorite president, Barack Obama, during Pride Month. Uh, And she made that interruption because she said, look, I need to to make sure that we get a release of LGBTQ immigrants uh, in detention centers and we need to put it into deportations. So she's not afraid of some of the biggest stages. Really what we wanted is to drive home the point that we must all find a fight and do something. Amazing, amazing. About to close out 2022. Thank you again to our guest, Nikki Lanier, who was just incredible. Go find some Eddie Glau Jr. Go find some Cornell West. Take us home, Tor. I close your mind and each and every one of you to find your 
voice to share the pod with your digital tribe to build be build better teams be a better human build better workplaces better culture do what judith glasner says in conversational intelligence everything happens through conversation for now jay and i are ghost see ya Hi there, I'm Heather Drago. And I'm Sarah Saunders. We host the podcast, That's a Hard No, about saying no and setting boundaries. So you can become that true and empowered you that this world needs. Saying no isn't just okay. It's the key to living an authentic, fulfilling life. I'm a licensed professional clinical counselor. So while this podcast is in no way a replacement for one-on-one therapy, I suppose I know what I'm talking about. I'd say so. We talk about learning to say no and set healthy boundaries and how it impacts mental health, physical health, relationships, parenthood, and more. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts and visit our website, hardnopodcast.com. We're here to help you find your no and say it unapologetically. That's a hard no.